Walking, listening, and communing with the risen Christ. That's the title of our sermon this morning. Today, as we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday as a commemoration of uh, the long-held belief, actually around 2,000 years of confession and affirmation that the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. In AD 325, uh, that's the Council of Nicaea. 
uh, the, the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bishops, the leaders of Christianity gathered together and came up with the Nicene Creed. That is say, it states, We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of the same essence as the father through him all things were made for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven he became incarnate by the holy spirit and the virgin mary and was made human he suffered and was buried the third day he rose again according to the scriptures this is our belief in a brief summary of the Apostles' teaching, commonly called the Apostles' Creed, around uh, six, the end of 6th century AD, which uh, it, it, it reached its final form, the Creed states, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father of god the father almighty from there he will come to judge the living and the dead and so literally around 2000 year history of christianity we have confessed and asserted that jesus christ our lord and savior has risen this is a historical event this is not just a confession or like a personal experience or a communal community of faith experience this has been proven time and again and a lot of historical evidence can be presented respected evangelical theologian in the 21st century john r w Studd wrote the most fantastic of all christian claims is that jesus christ rose from the dead and quote Furthermore, he confirms the grand affirmation of the New Testament is not he lives, but that he has risen. Unquote. Therefore, for us Christians, believing and affirming that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead is very important. It is critical to our Christian faith and belief. According to Apostle Paul, he says to the Corinthian believers, in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, And if Christ has not risen, has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. For, for Paul, for the Apostle Paul, the most important or essential event in history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without, without it, without the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are still hopeless. We are still enslaved in our sin. And, and that's why if, if Christ is not risen, the, the whole world is still in darkness. But you know, Christ has risen from the dead. And that's our proclamation. That's our confession. And so we are the most believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus are the most hopeful people on earth we have been rescued from darkness into the kingdom of light despite the biblical claims and the testimonies of transformation of lives there are still what we call um, erroneous beliefs there are doubts and questions surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his book the contemporary Christian again John R. W. Stott points out six fallacies or errors on the belief of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which he refuted. According to Stott, first, Jesus Christ is not a surviving influence like Che Guevara or Macarius of Cyprus, who are both are already dead, but their influence lingers, or they are still admired and being imitated. Secondly, Jesus Christ is not a resuscitated, resuscitated corpse or someone revived from swoon or coma, for he has been dead for about 36 hours. 
Thirdly, he is not the revived faith in the experience of his disciples, where they only experience the personal recovery of faith in their hearts and minds. Fourthly, Jesus is not an expanded personality where the very life and power and purpose and personality which was in him was, was actually continuing in the sphere of history. Fifthly, he is not merely a living experience of the Spirit where we think of his resurrection as a present experience rather than a factual past event, especially um, that an experience of the Spirit. Sixth and last, Jesus is not just a transformed person. The Gospels clearly teach that Jesus is the same person with the same identity, but that the resurrection gave him a transformed, transfigured, and glorified body. And quote. That's, that's from the Contemporary Christian, uh, the book written by John R. W. Stott. Now, now, having shared the errors of the belief surrounding the resurrection, which uh, John R. W. Stott refuted, Let's, let's look at the Bible, especially to the, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, as he presents to us the experience of two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And this happened three days after Jesus was crucified. Now, you may ask, why the Gospel of Luke? Why do we consider uh, the, Luke's, uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is the first volume uh, of, of the Luke Acts written by Dr. Luke? Because... He has done a thorough investigation of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, including ascension. Dr. Luke is Paul's companion in his, in his missionary journeys. And biblical scholars believe that the historical account he wrote is scholarly and acad academically excellent. And so today... As we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, let's listen to this narrative uh, written by, by Dr. Luke. In 45 minutes or so, let's discover what it is to walk, to listen, to converse, and to commune with the risen Christ. And let's learn the most important event that changed the world history, even your personal history, the history of the church forever. Let us pray. Father, we commit to you our meditation of your word. Let the Spirit speak to us. Let the Spirit, Spirit give us wisdom, give us wisdom. Let the Spirit open the minds and hearts of your people that we will be transformed and our belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will be rooted in your word and will change our lives forever. For your glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in this world, we are in a constant journey. We are always walking. We are always journeying. I think you will agree with me if I say that it will make a huge difference who we walk with, who we talk and converse with, who we commune with in this life. The person we're talking, the person we're communicating, the person we are to whom we we commune with is, is more important than the season we are in. Whether your experience are good or bad, whatever that season in your life, it really doesn't matter as long as you are with the right person. And in this journey, how we finish well is more important, is more critical than how we begin. Let's open our Bibles and read the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, 
concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to, to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had been, they had been had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is God's word. This account is only found in the Gospel of Luke. On the third day after Jesus' crucifixion, two disciples walked the road to Emmaus, which is seven miles, approximately 15 kilometers uh, from Jerusalem. For the two disciples, it was a road of despair, a road of hopelessness, and even a road of confusion and disillusionment. Despair and hopelessness because what they expected from Jesus Christ, the rabbi, crumbled at the cross. Cleopas uttered this frustration when he said in verse 21, But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Perplexed as well because of the report of the empty tomb by the women. Cleopas and his companion on that day just heard an unbelievable news from the four women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, the other Mary, Salome, and Mary Magdalene, that the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. They reported, the women reported that Jesus' body was nowhere to be found and that they saw an angelic apparition. The apostles, the apostles, the, the 11 disciples uh, with, with other disciples, uh, considered this news as an idle talk, as women's testimony at that time were inadmissible in the Jewish court. But Peter and John, when they went to the tomb, corroborated the women's testimony. As we can read in the earlier uh, verses of Luke chapter 24. The two were part of Jesus' outer circle of disciples, Cleopas and the companion. Remember that 72 uh, in Luke 17, 1 to 20, they are part of that group. And so as they wa walked together further, talking about what had happened, Jesus drew near and walked alongside them. But they didn't recognize him. This is the third among the ten uh, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And his, his resurrected body was, was changed in a degree uh, far better than his former human stature, that they had difficulty recognizing him. Just as Mary Magdalene mistook the risen Lord as, as a gardener in John 20, 14-15. When, when Jesus walked alongside them, 
he he was genuinely interested with what's been going on in 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 what their in what in their minds and in their hearts jesus inquired what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk this question halted their steps as they were suddenly overcome with deep sorrow deep sadness cleopas replied are you the only one visit uh, the only visitor to jerusalem who does not know about the things that have happened there in these days because the the crucifixion of jesus was in public and everyone who visited uh, Jerusalem during the Passover knew about that, that. He continued, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Cleopas uh, shared <laughs> about what happened to Jesus, that Jesus uh, of Nazareth was a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You see, this response of Cleopas and, and the other disciple revealed their misunderstanding of Jesus' identity and mission as the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. According to the teachers of the rabbi of Jerusalem, the Messiah will come from the royal blood and from the line of David, from the seed of Abraham, and from the throne of David and when he comes he will he will be a political leader who will who will banish the Roman rulers the Roman Empire he will come to free uh, Israel from from that uh, slavery from that um, dominion of, of the Roman Empire but it didn't happen because the first coming of the Messiah was not to conquer but but to save to save people from their sins and they misunderstood it Jesus response was both a direct rebuke and a loving correction Jesus said in verses 5, uh, 25 to 27 of chapter 24 in Luke "O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself actually Jesus was expounding the whole the entire Old Testament the Tanakh the, the Torah and the, uh, uh, the, the entire scripture of, of Israel Jesus pointed to them that what Moses the Pentateuch uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets, the major and the minor prophets, uh, they have written about him. They prophesied about his coming. He rebuked their slowness to believe despite the fact that he taught his disciples at least 11 times in the gospel narratives that the Son of God will suffer and die. They, they, it was hard for them to believe that the Messiah has to suffer and die first to, to, to offer his life as, a, as, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, in, this misinterpretation necessitates immediate correction. And so the risen Lord explained to them from the entire Old Testament scripture how it pointed out to his identity as Messiah and his mission as the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world who takes away the sin of the world that Jesus is the Messiah who will suffer first some scholars believe there are more than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament and these prophecies prophecies are specific enough that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them like just eight of them let alone all of them is staggeringly improbable if not impossible the seed of the woman in Genesis 3 15 who will bruise the head of the serpent the descendant of Abraham who will make him a blessing to all nations in Genesis 12 the one who will rule the throne of David for all eternity in Psalm 132 and Isaiah 9 the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 the son of man in the book of Daniel 
and the king of Israel who will be born in Bethlehem in Malachi points to the same person and that's Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, the risen Lord. The entire sacrificial system of Israel and the varied covenants beginning from Noah, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic and Davidic covenants foreshadow Jesus' ultimate sacrifice at the cross of Calvary. If you read the, the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, we will discover that Jesus has come to be the ultimate sacrifice. He is also the high priest, the perfect high priest, who will offer the perfect sacrifice for the remission of the sin of the world. Now, let me give you five examples from JesusFilm.org, uh, five prophecies and their fulfillment on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. First is the nations will be blessed through Abraham's lineage. In Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is the prophecy. And the fulfillment is in Acts chapter 3, 25 to 26. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Prophecy fulfillment. Second, David's offspring will have an eternal kingdom. The prophecy is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 to 13. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The fulfillment is in Matthew 1 verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Third, a virgin will give birth and he will be called Emmanuel or God with us. The prophecy is found in Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The fulfillment is in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you. Uh, angel Gabriel was speaking to, to Mary. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, to be born will be called the Son of God. Fourth, Jesus would become the perfect sacrifice. The prophecy is in Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The fulfillment is in Hebrews chapter 10, 5 to 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Quoting Isaiah chapter, uh, the, the, the book, uh, quoting Psalm 40. 6 to 8. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am, I have overcome, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will he, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. And fifth, Fifth prophecy in, uh, in Psalm 118, 17 to 18. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. This, this, this is the prophecy of the Messiah's uh, resurrection. The Lord has chastened me severely, severely, but he has not given me over to death. The fulfillment is in chapter 24, the, the passage we're considering in the Gospel of Luke 5 to 7. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. 
But the man said to them, Why do you look up for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Five of the prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in a single person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as the, they, as the, the two disciples were walking and they, as they neared Emmaus, it was towards evening. And so they invited the stranger to dine with them. And a surprising thing happened. As he blessed and broke the bread and gave it to them, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. The two disciples recognized Jesus, the risen Lord, during the communion. When Jesus blessed, broke, and they partook of the bread. They recalled, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And so while Jesus was expounding the Old Testament to them, explaining to them his person, his identity, and his mission, their hearts were already burning, and yet their sight failed to recognize that it was Jesus. It took the communion. It, it took the, the, the Holy Communion for them to, to recognize that Jesus indeed will, walked with them, talked with them, listened to them, and communed with them. The hearts of the two were burning from within, from within them. As Jesus was explaining plainly and entirely the Old Testament scriptures. But you know the significance of the Holy Communion? It was there that they, their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Lord. Writing to the Corinthians about around uh, 20 years after Jesus' uh, death, resurrection and ascension. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, let me begin with uh, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 26. When Jesus blessed and broke the bread and gave it to them, they recognized that he is the risen Christ. He is the Lord who has risen from the dead. He walked with them from Jerusalem to Emmaus. In their despair, confusion, bewilderment, and hopelessness, all along the Lord walked with them, explaining to them plainly the scriptures, making their hearts burn. But it was during the communion when they invited him, dine with us, when their eyes were open. This post-resurrection appearance of Jesus prompted the two to go back immediately to Jerusalem and report to the others who confirmed as well that Simon also saw the risen Christ. In Jesus' 10 post-resurrection appearances within 40 days from Jerusalem to Galilee, from the upper room to Emmaus, from the Lake of Galilee to Mount of Olives, to more than 500 individuals as, as Paul confirmed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8, two things are noticeable. We can notice two things. First, he only appeared to the disciples. No unbeliever saw him, not Pilate, not Herod, not the Roman soldiers, not the chief priests and the Pharisees, the, the unbelievers. Jesus only appeared to the believers, the, the disciples. It takes the eye of faith. Listen to this. It takes the eye of faith to see the risen Christ. Secondly, Jesus 
has to open the disciples' minds by expounding, explaining plainly the scriptures so that they will comprehend his identity and mission. This is necessary before they, they can proclaim repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus to, to all nations. This comprehension preceded the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Before the Holy Spirit during the Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus ascended, before the Holy Spirit came, they already understood fully the identity and the mission of Jesus Christ. And so 50 days, Pente, 50, Pentecost, the promised Holy, Holy Spirit came during Pentecost and they were empowered by the Spirit. The disciples in the upper room, the 120 disciples were burning with fire and the Spirit came as Jesus promised to them. And so they boldly proclaim, beginning with Peter, they boldly proclaim uh, the message of repentance and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Our lesson here is this. It takes a genuine understanding of the life and works of Jesus Christ, coupled with the anointing of the Spirit, for us to become effective witnesses to the world. Without that proper understanding of Jesus' life, identity, and His work, we cannot fully proclaim, clearly proclaim the truth, the gospel. And we also need the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. When we walk, converse, and commune with the risen Christ, our lives will undergo transformation. We will never stay the same. And this will lead us to a deeper intimacy, deeper knowledge of who He is, when we fully understand that He, Jesus Christ, is the promised Messiah, and that He came to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. God will rebuke our foolish understanding of who He is. He will rebuke uh, the false narratives that we are, we are holding on. And He will clear the web. He will give us the true narrative, the true story of who He is. He will enable us to see and believe His person and His teaching as we also allow the Spirit to, to be our guide, to be our teacher. As Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you, to your, remem you, to your remembrance, all that I have said to you. It's the work of the Spirit to teach us and to continually remind us of all the things, of all the commands and teachings of Jesus Christ. And so we praise the Lord for the promised Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you because you are with us. You are the seal of our salvation, but you are also our constant teacher and guide so that we will never forget what Jesus Christ has done. His work, his life, his identity, his person, we will always remember. And as we commune with him together through the blessing, breaking, and partaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, the broken body and the shed blood, which symbolizes, which is the symbol of the bread, broken bread and the wine, we will recall his great sacrifice and proclaim to all the world what he has done. We will always, with Paul, we will always remember in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you, pro you proclaim his death until he comes. There will never be an end to proclaiming what Jesus has done. This Holy Week, we remember that. And we should commemorate. It is very important to remind ourselves of what great sacrifice Jesus has done on the cross. Th this is free, my friend. This, the, the blood of Jesus has been offered freely but it cost His life, the Son of God. It cost the life of the Son of God to offer redemption for the world. And what we need is to hold on to what Christ has done, to believe in what He has done on the cross and therefore receive salvation. Can you relate with Cleopas? Let me ask you, where are you now in your journey? Can you relate with Cleopas and his companion? 
while they walked the road to Emmaus? Do you feel the heaviness that they felt? Are you sometimes, are you now, even now, are you confused, bewildered, and, and feeling hopeless? Are you in a situation where your eyes where your eyes are prevented to recognize Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Honestly, all of us have Emmaus Road experience. Um, I, I also have that kind of experience. We are not exempted. All of us are human. There are seasons in life where we can be blinded and we, we fail to see that God is working, that God is there, that God is still faithful and sovereign and God rules. There are events, especially in the past two years, when we feel that uh, somehow God has abandoned us. But my friends, that's not true. It's a false narrative. God will never abandon His children. God will always walk with you. God has been walking with you. God will walk with you, will walk with us until He comes again. The Lord, the risen Christ, will never leave us nor forsake us. That's reality. And the Lord will, will, will always listen. He is all ears. He is interested with our plight, whatever we are experiencing. The Lord will ask us, what's, what's going on with you, my, my child? What, what's your feeling now? Uh, what, what's your confusion all about? He is all ears. He wants to listen to you. And after that, He will correct lovingly he will rebuke us lovingly he will warm our heart with his word with the scripture and he will point us to himself again because you know in in, in hebrews chapter 11 we can finish well if we fix our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith that that's the only secret of finishing well fix our eyes on jesus because He is the risen Lord. He is the risen Christ. And He will never fail us. He has conquered death. And so victory is with Jesus. He will tell you as He told His disciples in John 16 verse 33. In the world you will have troubles. You will have tribulations. Jesus acknowledged that. Because this world is ruled by, by the enemy. But you know. Jesus has already bruised the head of the serpent. He has conquered the enemy. He even conquered death by his resurrection. And so he said, you will have trouble, you will have tribulation, but take heart. Listen to this. What Jesus said is this. I have overcome the world. Jesus is our champion. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our constant deliverer, whatever situation we are in. And so, in the beginning I said, in this journey, what matters is who we walk with, who we talk with, who we commune with. The person we are walking, listening, and communing is more important than the season we are in. And so when Jesus is your companion, when the risen Christ is constantly with you, you are constantly walking in intimacy with the risen Christ. My friends, we will overcome the world because Jesus has overcome the world. We need the eyes of faith to see the risen Christ as we walk in our Emmaus road. Our hearts will surely burn, burn within us as, as He will continue to remind us of who He is through the power of the Spirit, through our guide and teacher, the Spirit. And then we will joyously celebrate, constantly celebrate the Holy Communion, because it is the proclamation of His sacrificial death on the cross. We proclaim constantly what He has done. During this Holy Week, we proclaim to the world that Christ died once for all. That through His death, people, humanity can be reconciled back to God. That humanity can have peace with God. And there will be no more condemnation if you and I, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the risen Christ. My brothers and sisters, today as we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, remember that in our Emmaus Road, the Lord will walk with us. The Lord will spound His word. He will remind us of all the truth. And then in the breaking of the bread, when we share in the table of communion, we will recognize Him and we will bow down before Him and worship Him.
and thank Him. And when we do that, we will be transformed in His likeness. In the name of God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. A blessed day, church. I believe God has blessed you this morning through the message of our beloved pastor. I believe that God has spoken to you. And we praise God because indeed more than any material things that we receive, God has blessed us far greater that those are spiritual blessings in Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That inheritance is in Christ, and that is also Christ. We thank God that by His generosity and love for all of us, we are encouraged also to live and to give for Him, to live for Christ, and to give for His cause. So this morning, let us give our best to God. As a reminder, we can securely give our tithes and offering through GCash and bank accounts posted on the screen. So as we give, I would like to pray for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are indeed a generous Father to all of us that you have given every need, material and above all, spiritual for us. Lord, as we live this life, may this life honor you. And as we give for your cause, Lord, may our giving give you praise and exalt your name. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you have done for us, for our jobs, for our families, and for our church. We honor you, God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much. You are all a blessing. Have a blessed Sunday. Brothers and sisters, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you shalom, the peace that passes all understanding, now and forevermore. Amen and Amen. Hello kids! I'm Teacher Celine. Thanks so much for being here! Today, I have a one word to share with you. This one word will tell us the story of Easter Sunday. Our word is startling. Startling. Mary makes a startling discovery. The grave is empty. Starting, she is starting to wonder what has happened here. Staring, and now Mary is staring at the stone that has been rolled away. String, all the clothes are neatly folded up, not a loose string in sight. Sting, Mary is feeling the sting. Has someone stolen the body? Sing. But then she meets the risen Lord and she wants to sing. Because she discovers 
Jesus is alive! Sin Now she knows what happened on the cross. Jesus has broken the power of death and sin. In And through his resurrection, everyone who believes in him can be part of God's family. I What do I do? Everybody needs to know. So Mary goes on her way to tell the disciples. Our memory verse today is Matthew 28, 5-6. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. So like Mary, let's tell the world that Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead and He has saved us all!
Matthew chapter 28 verse 5 to 6 The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Thank you, Teacher Christine, for our arts and crafts video. And thank you for reciting our Bible verse today. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time, only here at the Children's School of Character. Always remember that Jesus loves you. Bye!